Our children would be much better off only if politicians would give public schools more money so they can pay teachers more and reduce class sizes. You've heard it, you might believe it, but is it even true? Hi, I'm Ben Scafferty, and I'm a Friedman Fellow at EdChoice and a professor of economics at Kennesaw State University. I'm also author of Back to the Staffing Surge, The Great Teacher Salary Stagnation, and the Decades-Long Employment Growth in American Public Schools. In my report, I measured U.S. public school employment growth versus student enrollment growth and teacher salaries and student outcomes over the past 65 years using publicly available data that state departments of education annually report to the U.S. Department of Education. The results were eye-opening. Using these public reports, one can place each public school employee into one of two categories, teachers and all other staff. All other staff includes district and school administrators, teacher aides, counselors, social workers, reading and math coaches, janitors, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, curriculum specialists, and everybody else. We found that from 1950 to 2015, the number of full-time equivalent teachers increased almost two and a half times as fast as the increase in students, resulting in significantly smaller class sizes. Yet at the same time, the number of non-teachers, or all other staff, increased more than seven times the increase in students. Because public schools began desegregating and welcoming students with special needs, it could be argued that this staffing surge was worth it in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and even into the early 1990s. But it's still going on, even in recent decades. And after a 60-year staffing surge, public school employment did decline slightly during the Great Recession. But since the recession ended, it appears that public school staffing has bounced right back, back to the staffing surge. But at what cost? The great teacher salary stagnation. What we know is this, inflation-adjusted salaries for public school teachers fell by 2% at the same time the hiring of non-teaching staff continued to outpace student enrollment growth. Instead of raising teacher salaries over and above the cost of living, the American public education system invested more in non-teachers. Even during a rare anomaly, the Great Recession, when public school staffing declined slightly, public school administrators showed they were more likely to fire teachers than they were to fire administrators and other non-teaching staff. And this has led to some missed opportunities. The disproportionate favoring of all other staff has presented the public education system with a very large opportunity cost. What could the public education system have done instead? Check this out. If the increase in all other staff alone had matched student enrollment growth between 1992 and 2015, then a cautious estimate finds that the American public schools would have saved $35 billion in annual recurring savings. That's $35 billion every single year from 1992 to 2015, for a cumulative total of over $800 billion during this time period. What are some other ways that this money could have been spent? Public schools could have given every teacher in America a permanent $11,100 raise. And remember, that's while continuing to hire teachers at a rate higher than student enrollment growth. That's more teachers earning higher pay just by bringing all other staff hiring down to match student enrollment growth. Another option, every year, states could have given more than 4 million students $8,000 education savings accounts, known as ESAs, that could have been used to offset tuition payments at private schools to save for college or pay for other educational services. What it boils down to is this, the money used to fund the public school staffing surge placed a significant opportunity cost that came before raises for teachers, and it came before school choice opportunities for students. But what do critics say when confronted with this evidence of the system's inefficiency? They do not deny that the staffing surge occurred, but they argue that the staffing surge and the billions spent funding it was necessary to improve academic outcomes of an increasingly disadvantaged student population. 
But if they were correct, then the following two things should have been true. First, the student population during that time should have been less advantaged when compared to previous generations. And second, student academic outcomes should have actually improved during the staffing surge. Exhibit A, no empirical study has found that students of today are more disadvantaged than previous generations. There are now four studies on this topic, and each finds that American students of today are not more disadvantaged by critics' own measures relative to students in decades past. Yes, kids today have some characteristics that critics would say lower student achievement. That said, students in more recent years have characteristics by critics' own logic that would suggest higher student achievement relative to students of decades ago. For example, there are fewer children in families, so parents of today have more time to spend on homework with each child. Child poverty is much lower today relative to the 1960s, and parents have more educational attainment today. So if the public school system had just maintained its productivity, student achievement should have gone up, as kids today on balance are more advantaged than students of decades ago. But higher student achievement is not a result defenders of the staffing surge can boast. Exhibit B, public school student outcomes have not improved during the staffing surge. Public high schoolers' reading and math scores have essentially remained stagnant for more than two decades. Also, U.S. Department of Education data available shows that public school graduation rates have been lower in some recent years than they were in 1970. During the post-2009 staffing retreat, reported graduation rates actually increased. So there does not seem to be a positive relationship between staffing and student achievement. So what do we do now? We can continue the staffing surge and its diversion of resources away from teachers and away from school choice opportunities for parents and students. Or perhaps it's time to move to a new education system, one that is student-centered and one that devotes more of its considerable resources to its talent on the front lines our teachers. Thanks for listening, and for more details and for data on your state, please download the full report by visiting www.edchoice.org forward slash staffing search. Thank you. <laughs>